Talk Show. It's the Daily Talk Show, episode 436. And we have a special guest in the studio, Marley Silver. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you guys? Oh, we're very good. Yeah. Uh, you're in Melbourne. Um, I am. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. You're in our studio, <laughs> just in case you didn't know where you were. Well, it feels like a bit like a casino. So people will come in here and they don't realise how long they've been in this space. It's got oh, sort of like... Yeah, the lighting. There's no, li- there's no yeah. uh, windows. There's no clock. You just lose less money here. Because <laughs> yeah, we, that's yeah. good. That's yeah. fine. Actually, watch your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> get, don't get away from it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we actually met, it's probably like the start of the year. I think it was last, that was last year. Was it was really? It? Yeah. No, I think it was January. Was it? No, I think it was. Anyway. Oh. I think it was. It was the. Yep. Yeah, trust me. It was the year before. Twenty eighteen. So we made a video with uh, Ziggy, Ziggy. Rama. Yeah. Love Ziggy. And um. And you were there. You you helped sort of all tee that all up. And then the video came out much later. That's why mm-hmm. I think you think it was uh, the, yeah, the, sure. the next year. Honestly, mm-hmm. the last twelve months is blurred into one. Yeah. <laughs> Second. <laughs> well, it's, it's been very busy for you because when we first met you, um, you didn't have your podcast mm-hmm. at that point. We well, didn't have Titus for Titus at all. So I remember seeing on Instagram you did a post, and I was like, oh, what's this thing? And I click through and I start following from the Daily Talk Show, and then over the course of six months you've gone from how do you describe how do you describe what's what's happened oh it's just been like an explosion Mm. um completely surpassed what i expected like i I started it on a whim and kind of thought that it would it consist of of me putting these stories that i cared about out into the ethos and you know my friends and family would be like oh that's cool but that would be it and then um yeah, we're like at 15.7 thousand. Mm-hmm. Now, what came first, the the Instagram page? Like, like the I think, name? Because yeah, you... a lot of people like won't do something, i.e. Josh, unless it, you can get the Instagram handle. And, <laughs> and so, which I think, you know, having an Instagram, like having an idea, turning into an Instagram, it then can evolve into something bigger, which it yeah. has, titties mm-hmm. for titties. What is it for people that, that aren't? you know, get with it. 15,000 people are already following it, so start following it. <laughs> so um, Titter is an Aboriginal slang word which means sister. So essentially it translates as sisters for sisters and it's, um, yeah, social media based but we're starting to move in, into different areas, um, a platform that's all, all dedicated to um, empowering and inspiring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women uh, by sharing stories of, of everyday women and, and big role models and leaders from across the country in what they're doing and um yeah it's now a podcast which is kind of insane uh so it's an interesting story how that came about um one of our i think i commented on a um a post about brooke boney doing an interview with mia friedman um from the account and mia saw it and stalked me and then slid into my dms and asked me over for a cup of tea and said you know, I mean, obviously a few things happened in between that, but literally within a week of her messaging me, she was like, I think we can offer you a podcast. And I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> and is, has that been a thing that strategically, have you always thought about the the marketing? Like you've got a um, communications background, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Has that been something of like, I'm going to comment and then this will happen and this happens? <sighs> I would like to think that I had a, <laughs> some sort of strategy yeah. going on. I mean, the reason we grew so quickly, we had a thousand followers within a week because my sister is mates with Latrell Mitchell, the rugby league player, and messaged him and kind of was like, hey, if you think this is cool, share it on your story. Um, and he actually did a post about it. And Amazing. It, uh, you know, like so instantly from him doing that, my, my phone died from how many people were like following us and stuff. Um I realised that if we wanted to reach more people, we'd have to get the right people on board. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's probably a little bit of strategy around, like, one, who you're following and, like, mm. what you're keeping tabs on uh, and being very engaging and, and not only, like, commenting on lots of things but, like, commenting back and making yeah. sure and message people back and all that kind of stuff. So when was that, um, 2018, November? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so fast forward to now, you, you're in Melbourne. This morning you were you were doing a talk. Yeah. Is so it, you had the Madonna microphone on. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you could hardly see it. It's, it's getting very, very, very discreet, but um, I definitely feel like a wiggle every time. <laughs> I just want to go like. like you still can. Just have, yeah. Own it. Own it. It's your Absolutely. stage. Yeah, I think that could be a brand value. And so, and so do you think 
that something like this morning, the talk um, wouldn't have come about had you not sort of taken that first step in starting? Yeah, it's weird um, because this whole like speaking life is not that new to me. Um, I used to work in the nonprofit sector and my a big part of my role that I had for a 12 month period, um, it was, I was a co-CEO of an organization, uh, which was like a 12 month, sort of like a cadetship um, where I worked really closely with the CEO. And it meant that I was in a lot of rooms like I was this morning and mm. um, telling my story. So like my first job as part of that role was to write a 20 minute keynote um, to present to a room full of 200 people. And I had never done that before. And I was 20 at the time. Um, so I very much had to learn on my feet. Mm. And I think that, um, yeah, I had a lot of opportunities where I've been able to share like that. So maybe I, I would have been asked to something like this, but no, mm. definitely not the context of the this particular event because it's about inspiring like big businesses to think more socially and, mm. and how they can um, give back and, and provide uh, new opportunities for different groups to, to do better. So mm. I think almost being considered a businesswoman is a completely new thing for me. Um, do you see yourself as a businesswoman? I don't know if I feel comfortable with it yet because mm. I guess because there's all these little branches of the Titus for Titus concept that are kind of emerging with podcast and then there's, you know, we're doing some stuff in schools and there's more people who want us to do face-to-face -face stuff. It's going to end up something of a business. Um, I don't know how you would mm. categorize it at all. Well, I don't think you have to think you're a businesswoman to become a businesswoman. I don't, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. being just starting a business. It's these things can happen so organically where you see something getting traction. And you're like, you know, I think I was, my wife was saying last night, she's like, we're, we're talking about um, Zoe Foster Blake and go to skincare and, and she, and we're just talking about that business. And she's like, I don't know if I could do that. But I don't know if you think ahead that far mm. that you – like us right now, we can't be the version we want to be yeah. this moment because we have to get there, but it's, it starts somewhere. And I think it's also for women in particular to mm. kind of uh, outwardly share that that's what they're aspiring to or even talk about pursuing something like that because there's still this stigma of, of – you know, wanting to be, and also like it's an Australian attitude, right? Mm -hmm. Like the tall poppy syndrome sort of stuff. Like if you talk about it like that, it, it can be quite um, scary. Like people's responses go and people doubt you. Uh, yeah, particularly if you're a woman or if you're an Aboriginal woman or mm. the, the expectations are just like very low. Mm. But there's all there's also a huge expectation around like as an Aboriginal woman having to feel, I guess, like representing a whole community, mm. how how do you reconcile that? Is there is there a, a technique or a way that you you view it? Well, it's it's interesting because the first time I guess I was expected to be the representative and the knowledge holder of eighty thousand years of history um, mm. was in high school. Uh, I was the only Aboriginal student there until my sister got there. Um, I grew up in the Sutherland Shire in New South Wales, Cronulla, very famous for race riots. Mm. Um, and <laughs> I, you know, it's a very high Anglo-Saxon population and most of my peers had never met an Aboriginal person before. So at a moment where I was essentially outed to my school um, as a black fella, a lot of questions came flying at me, um, ones that were, you know, kind of ill-informed because – kids, right, mm -hmm. um, who, who grew up in households where their parents are talk a certain way. Yeah, but all kids are pretty dumb. Like, that's, like, <laughs> I, like if, if we're being – I was yeah, assumed yeah. dumb. And no yeah, filter, no yeah. filter as yeah. well, yeah. right? No, you know, you're still learning your social cues and, like, what's appropriate and stuff. So, But I definitely think the uh, product of environment, of environment. Mm -hmm. like you're saying, the parents, yeah. like I think about myself when I was young and, and the the dialogue then to compared to now it's completely different, yeah. right? Or I'm, maybe I've just become slightly more intelligent. But Not you, that much, you but. also have to unlearn certain yeah, things as yeah. you become an adult. But like one, you know, question in particular that has, I talk about very often because it, it's kind of like the central point of my life where I kind of think of everything as happening before that or after it. And it was after my dad picked me up from school one day and one of my peers saw him and asked me the next day um, why my dad was black. And 
never had I heard someone be called a colour and it was like mm. the first – because growing up in a mixed household, it's obviously not something you ever talk about because it's not relevant. Um, like in terms of skin colour, obviously mm. culture is a different thing, but skin colour is, a, you know, I think when you bring that into it, it becomes the, the ostracising element of um, society. So that was the real moment where you kind of go, oh, my God, like – People think that my dad is different to their mm, dad mm. because of how he looks or whatever. Um, but, yeah, so that was the moment I was outed, right? Mm. And so then you start getting asked about what a witchetty grubs taste like and do you believe in the dream time? And then also, like, about our history and, like, you know, what does this mean or tell us about this. And, and this is even teachers would ask me this sort of stuff. And so, what, what kind of knowledge around that stuff did you have at that, at that age? My, my knowledge was like my family's stories yeah. and my experience as an Aboriginal woman. So, you know, like, but it's stuff that I accepted as normal mm. when you're not, you know, it would be like, we always went into Yarbin, which is the festival that they hold in Victoria park in Sydney on January 26th. Never had I celebrated Australia day. Um, but I also didn't know that that wasn't normal um, and I didn't realise the tensions around the day. And I also didn't realise until much later on in my adolescence that it was quite – it was a, like a divisive day. Like as much as um, I knew that we weren't celebrating, I I didn't really question it. I didn't mm. go, why are we, why are we mad or, or why, mm. are, why do we do this? And then all my mates go down to Cronulla – um, for the big festival and wear the Australian flag. And also, sub, I don't know, you know, subconsciously why I don't feel like I connect to that flag, but I connect to mine. And what about dad? Um, is that something that he was not, so he wasn't aware of or he was and he kept that from yeah, you? Yeah, I think that um, mum and dad did a, like a good job of um, – protecting us from things, but it wasn't like they were trying to wrap us up in cotton wool. It was more mm. like, no, nah, this is just how it is. And like they didn't politicise things um, when it came to I, – I loved Yarbin so much. I loved that day because I would be in with all my family at this awesome festival and we'd just be talking about how mad it is to be a black fella. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we just we just accepted it. That, mm. That's what it was. And then it wasn't until people started going, well, why do you do that? And I remember one girl – um, my sister had been in um, at Yarbin with us and she had like our flag tattooed on her face and then she'd gone to meet her friends at the beach after and one of them said, why do you have that flag on? It's Australia Day. Mm. I mean, again, what we were just saying, kids, dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like that was one of the first times where you kind of go, wait, what? Like we we, we are this country. Like yeah. we're the foundations of it, you know. And also I think I didn't even realise it was a national day of celebration like in the way that it I guess it is um and then that you know it's all those little touch points where you kind of have these glass shattering moments um of realization that I live in a bubble um and a bubble that if, you know is a microcosm of what you would like to think Australian society is I'm a very multicultural family like even on my mum's side my mum's white and like I have cousins who are Lebanese and Filipino and they're married to Islanders and it's like the UN. Like, <laughs> yeah. and, Well, in, so, in some ways, like you're describing that you, beca you've, you became a novelty within the, pl the playground, mm. which I find interesting because your dad's a cop yeah. and I feel like as a kid, if you oh, found yeah. out that someone's dad was a yeah. cop, it's always like how many people has he shot? Yeah. Like yeah. has he got a gun all the time? Well, see, this is, it's the trifecta because um, – yeah, we're Aboriginal, he's a cop, and he's a former rugby league player. I thought you were going to say you had a double-storey house growing up because that, <laughs> yeah, was, that was That was huge. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a big question. <laughs> Swimming pool. Yeah, yeah. that's her. <laughs> water bed. <laughs> Always wanted to ask you about the water bed. Like, yeah. how do you fill it up? You know? What? Uh, <laughs> a lot of novelties. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so, what, like, was that, a, was that even a weird thing? Like, would people bring up the whole cop thing as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, people were scared of that because mm. they'd be like, Oh, big black guy with a gun. Um, but then they'd talk to him for 30 seconds and realise he's actually a 15-year-old boy. Um, and <laughs> with a gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he loves, like, he just mucks around. Like, yeah. he's not a very serious guy at all. Um, but people just look at him because he looks like a cop. Yeah, In yeah. a room, Pe standing there, he looks like a cop. People like. serious always say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not that serious. <laughs> but then he's got the badge and the gun side. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. With him. But he just loves a laugh. So mm. um, particularly when, like boys would come to the house. Um, I had a lot of male friends mm. and they'd always like, you just see the look on their face when dad would 
<laughs> walk in the room, they go, ah, hello, Mr. Silver. And they'd be like, oh, what up, man? Like, and then they're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, it's fine. But it was the cough thing. And then, um, yeah, also the footy thing was a big thing. Yeah. Um, especially when there were, we got to that kind of age group where there was a lot of boys around me who wanted to be rugby league players. Mm. And so, um, so when you, uh, when the teachers start asking you questions, I mean, you're meant to be the student learning and the yeah. teachers are asking these things. Did you then go home and ask a bunch of questions or did you feel the r responsibility? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, at first I was exactly that, that feeling of like, hey, you're meant to be teaching me. Um, crap, am I a bad Aboriginal person? Like should I be knowing all of this straight away? And in hindsight it's like no. Like, mm. you know, first of all, the way that we pass down knowledge has been damaged through um, – all, all the atrocities and removal of culture that we've seen in the last 250 years. Um, but also I'm young and I, I, you know, wanted to learn at the same rate as everyone else. But I did, I did go home and um, ask so many questions. And mm. um, one of my uncles is an academic and he is like, he genuinely is one of the knowledge holders of our family. And I remember ringing him, uh, asking dad for his number to ring him and dad was kind of like, okay, okay, whatever. And I spoke to him for a few hours and I was like, can you just like tell me about this, tell me about that? And um, he he was really helpful in that sense. And I, the more I learned about my family's stories, I think that was, you know, what I focused on for a long time. So when I was representing myself, that's who I was representing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, as much as my parents had done a really good job of, you know, not politicizing things, not that it's a bad thing to do so. I became very political very, very quickly um, and, you know, very angry. I was a mm. very angry teenager um, and it's crazy. Like there was one point where I had peers write Marley Silver sniffs petrol on um, school property, graffiti to, um, and I was just sick of it. And I remember sitting at the dinner table next to my white mother and saying, I hate white people. Like that was the point that I was pushed to, which is insane. And it, it, it's taken a few years. Like I, I still have, you know, problems trusting um, non-Indigenous people sometimes, like particularly in certain corporate environments and some people when you can kind of see the way that they react when I have, you know, my flag on because I always have different Aboriginal earrings on and things like that and people kind of look at you and you, you just get scared. Mm. And it's not scared because I think they're going to be, you know, blatantly racist to me but they have expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it, it's a, was a weird journey to kind of navigate. I think every teenager goes through that identity crisis. Um, I mean, going through an identity <laughs> crisis as a teenager is yeah. hard enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And did you feel – was there a fork in the road where you had to – go down the path of activism and really being strong mm. versus not? Yeah. So, I mean, I, f I found that that fork in the road was almost when someone asked me, you know, why dad was black a little bit. And then it kind of was furthered because um, the school kind of uh, leadership saw me as a almost like a PR opportunity for mm. the school mm. um, because I was academically pretty good. Um and so they would parade me out in front of the Department of the Ed of Education as the ideal Aboriginal student. I would go to any kind of event um, that they had opportunity to send me to. And um, actually probably in Year 10 um, I went to this leadership camp um, in Queensland and I was like the youngest one there. It was mostly like senior students and – over like four days of just having these amazing leaders like talk to us and kind of really pump us up and um, just tell us how amazing it is to be Aboriginal. That was probably the moment I realised like, hey, I have a voice mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's people who want to listen to it and who are kind of excited by my, me and like mm -hmm. all the young people around me. So that was probably the first time I was, I think it's being pushed into that leadership position where you kind of go, okay, this is, you know, maybe I have to speak out a little bit more. And um, so, does that shift from a feeling of anger to channeling that, that just energy? Yeah, into, to a purpose. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I was still pretty angry um, yeah. <laughs> until I probably I left school, and then you get to uni, and I loved uni mm -hmm. um, because I loved, you know, being able to choose what I studied and also not being 
told what to do by teachers. Um, did you get into the extracurricular activities and stuff? I did. Yeah, well, great. I volunteered um, in a few things, like uh-huh. all things like related back to helping Aboriginal community. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it was like studying again. It was like a clean slate at mm. uni and I found myself being like, hey, like my stories and like what I've gone through um, because I was volunteering with Aboriginal kids, I've turned it into something positive. It's now a tool to help people get through what I went through and also educate non-Indigenous people about like what's appropriate. Um, so that was the beginning point. So 18 is probably the time where I was like, hey, I'm, I've dealt with my emotions. I'm doing pretty good and like let's do this. Let's do something more. Is there education that you end up doing with your family and parents too? Because I feel like you're getting – such a unique perspective where you're talking to all, like you're in that space, you're having that conversation. Has there been interesting conversations within the family based on that? Yeah. Um, it's it's really interesting because my sister and I um, were less than two years apart. We were only one year apart at school and we had very similar experiences, exactly the same upbringing, but very different responses to it. Um, so it really impacted her self-confidence and it kind of, she turned inward while mm-hmm. I was went outward. Um, so that's caused a little bit of tension in the household, like not to a point where it's like a big problem, but mm-hmm. there's been things we've disagreed on in terms of how we respond to things. So that's a really interesting discussion because, um, yeah, we're, we're talking about the exact same thing. We mm-hmm. have different perspectives on it and it's kind of that whole like pick your battles thing and, um, you know, managing your energy and like who you should be, you know, addressing it and that sort of stuff. And for um, – Mum and dad, I think the the hardest thing for them is both of them had hoped that what my dad went through as a um, young man was not something we'd ever have to see or ever have to experience. And I think mum talks about being really heartbroken and feeling quite hopeless at some of the stuff that um, we went through. That And more sort of stuff that I think we must have blocked out or something because she – there's been a couple of times I've told stories mm. in sort of platforms like this and she's mm. like, I didn't know about that. And I'm like, really? Mm. She's my like, mom, my, yeah, mums can do that. They've yeah. got a great power yeah. <laughs> of blocking stuff out that was yeah. very hard for them. I mean, they're, they're older, they understand, they're seeing things mm-hmm. and then it probably affects them. Like I've got a young son and I think about the future and, yeah. you know, that kind of, I know my mum, the struggles I went through, she like, can't remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I remember them. Yeah, so. yeah. So I, I have felt, you know, bad for them because I don't want them to think they didn't do enough because it's got absolutely nothing to do with them. We had the perfect environment to Mm. grow up in. We're so lucky in so many ways. But it's also accepting that as much as you can have the best place at home, you're not safe from the outside world. Mm. Um, And so, yeah, that's been hard and in the sense that I I, – I'm sorry for them to feel like that um, because it's just so not their fault and they did everything right. It's just unfortunately the rest of the world – isn't like us. How do you experience gratitude? Like I feel like when you're dealing with such massive issues, mm. um, it could be so easy or like I th- and also make so much sense to be in it and thinking about it. Mm. Um, how do you fit gratitude amongst amongst all your experiences? Like gratitude for. Well, I think like like from a so for instance all the things that have happened and the uh, activism that you're doing and all that sort of thing, you're having, you're reliving all of these horrendous moments. Uh, And we get told all the time by self-help, it's like, you got to be good. Like gratitude is so important. Finding gratitude in the pain. No, 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 definitely not the pain, but but just just having fucking balance in life where it's like, if you're spending all this time (laughs) doing that stuff, how do you, how do you then uh, on the weekend, chill like chill the fuck out as well oh yeah i don't really have weekends um what are they uh (laughs) downtime someone asked me about downtime this week in an interview and i was like i sleep Mm. yeah that's my downtime but um no i the biggest thing that you need and this is something i've actually had to learn in the last 18 months so a bit later on in the piece um is who you surround yourself with it Mm. is so vital like i Halfway through last year, I found myself in a bit of a social rut and it kind of was affecting my career path because I was still doing my honours at uni and was figuring out, you know, what I would do when I had to become a real adult after it. (laughs) Um, And I kind of felt a bit stuck and a bit 
icky and just like I don't feel like myself and um, I realised it was because of the people I was hanging out with. And as much as they're not bad people at all and they're just normal, you know, 20-something-year-olds, they were living for the weekend mm. and they were worried about, you know, drinking. They were just – all they would do on a Monday is text in the group message and be like, fire out, I can't wait for a beer on Friday. Yeah. You know, like – and I'm like, whoa, that's so not me at all. Like, yeah, I like to have fun and, and you know, when I do have the off chance of downtime and chilling out – um. I, I don't have the time to like be, you know, so hungover on a Sunday that I can't plan for my week. Yeah. And um, I actually, you, you need your body to be able to recover and you can't do that if you're just absolutely slaughtering it every single weekend. Yeah. And so, you know, it's scary to do at 23, but I had to like make new friends. And how do you, do you cut them off or you just stop talking to them or what's the just, approach? You just gradually move away yeah um, you say no to go into the pub <laughs> 10 times they yeah. probably won't yeah. ask you when yeah 11th. exactly it, exactly yeah. and it's it's hard because there's no there was no confrontation and it's not like i have any animosity towards these people mm. um it's just a lifestyle difference and yeah there was a point in time when yeah, i was interested in going out every weekend um but i just don't have the <laughs> energy for it anymore mm. and it don't it doesn't fill me back up i know i've Realized the first time I worked full time, I took a year off uni to be that co CEO position, and I burnt out really quickly. Well, you're doing vlogging. I saw the couple of vlogs that oh you did. Oh, you were vlogging. Uh, yeah, that's hey. not 15 day mark, 30 day mark. Yeah, that was good. I loved it. I mean, how far did you get? Oh, well, we, I was supposed to do it. Like, I didn't do videos all the time. It was just when I couldn't be bothered to write something. I think it's great. Like, yeah. It, I mean, the thing that s stands out to me with you is like listening to your podcast and watching is your ability just to present and communicate and the even like we're talking off air about my inability to hold on to information and then you just like mm. like I can talk but I can it's not that I make sense and so I <laughs> mean the people you hang around is it me <laughs> so, I mean, no, is it not hanging Mr. out with anyone um <laughs> it's, was that a skill that you found early on and just worked on and developed uh like the storytelling speak, yeah, yeah storytelling um and, so I was super shy um when I was like a little kid, my mum was very worried about it as I was going to primary school because I would like, we'd be in a, you know, a fr family friend's barbecue and I would be like attached to her leg and like wouldn't go play with the other kids and stuff. Because um, kids are dumb. Yeah, because <laughs> obviously I knew that early on. Um, and so she was scared when I was going to go to primary school that I wouldn't make any friends. Um, so she put me into drama class. And um, being on stage and Telling a story is, I, I don't know, it just I just have this inherent passion and I think a talent for it that, um, yeah, I, I refined a little bit over 15 years of drama classes. Mm. What sort of productions did you work on? What were you at? Uh, um, oh, God. what? Surely there's a grace. <laughs> no, no. I, oh, absolutely no musical talent <laughs> oh, no, at musical. all. Okay. Um, Oh my god! Why can't I remember Shakespeare? What's that play? Everyone does it, and it's the witches, like in the oh, um, the Crucible, the Crucible. Oh, Did yeah, the Crucible? Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, and then for my uh, Year Twelve drama uh, individual performance, I did a ten minute monologue from the film Candy with Heath Ledger uh -huh. and Abby Cornish. So heroin addict, really uh -huh. light subject matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I. I, I <sighs> I found myself like uh, as a teenager, a little bit socially awkward. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt more comfortable standing on a stage talking to a room full of, you know, four to 500 people um, than I did, you know, talking to my hairdresser. Like, yeah. I hate, I hate I, the hairdresser. I can really relate to you. <laughs> and you, are you still that person? Um, I mean, you don't have to say you hate your no, hairdresser no, still. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't hate individual hairdressers. I just don't like do you go to the Do you go to the same hairdresser all the time? No, 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 no. Uh, this is my problem. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do? You just go to a random one each time? Well, so my hair is quite short now. I mm -hmm. cut it, a lot of it off at the beginning of the year. <laughs> As in you're personally cutting your hair now just so you, to well, avoid the hairdresser. So, so before, <laughs> this, yeah, before this, for the past three years prior to cutting it this short, my mum has been treating it because I refuse to go to the hairdresser. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, nah, I want to go really short and I don't trust you. Yeah. Well, excuse me. Um, with the the scissors to go to do that because I'm uh -huh. probably end up with a bowl cut. So yeah. I went to the hairdresser and um, no, my hairdresser is really lovely. Okay, great. She's really, yeah. And she has cute little kids. So I actually just talk to the kids. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So that was kind of um, where I, I guess 
I, I never felt like I trained to be able to tell a story, but mm-hmm. I guess that's kind of what it was. Yeah. And then also, um, and no, no, yeah, I guess it's just that that passion. And I feel like when I spoke this morning, um, someone like took a picture of me and like put it on Instagram and I like reshared it on my story and my mum messaged me being like, oh my God, like how do you not like crap your pants yeah. when you do this? And I'm like. You it, do, it's a nappy. Yeah, <laughs> it's I wear one, I've got one all right now. Alex, for every TED talk, they're all got nappy. <laughs> if you look um, and I said to her, it actually makes me feel really good. Like I don't mm. feel nervous. Um, maybe I'm a sociopath. Uh, but I genuinely just Welcome. feel. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of narcissists here. So. But yeah, no, it makes me feel really good. Is so. it because it's your st- story? Are there certain things where it's like, oh, this is out of my realm and I'm not comfortable? I haven't found it yet. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I think because I, I don't know, I'm very clear on what my messages are and, and like what my purpose is in particular rooms that I, I don't have any desire to kind of wander off into to things I'm not qualified to talk mm. about. Mm-hmm. Um, is it cathartic? Yeah. I think it's been a massive part of the healing process. Mm. I can tell these stories now in this way and um, not get upset, not because they're not emotional anymore, but because I've healed from it. And I guess that goes back to that um, the gratitude thing mm. because I'm I'm thankful of the, op- the opportunity to share and, and to learn in telling the story as well because you learn more about yourself in the way you tell mm. things. Um, and now... Yeah, being in a space where I'm strong enough to do that and to be vulnerable and also to call people out on things, um, you know, especially on a big platform, which is that was something that was a little bit scary as we grew quite big um, because it means that more people see you and then more people who are not part of um, the community that you want to be part of it yeah. um, who kind of are just like, again, blatantly racist or mm-hmm. like the – own opinions and, th- and things like that. That was scary for me, not because it was going to affect me because of, of, you know, what I've just been talking about, but because we have lots of young people who follow us who are not at that point. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want them to have to see it on what is such a positive place for us. Um, and then when it happened a couple of times, you know, I also had to catch myself in how much I – you know, gave them. And mm. when you go to a point where you're like, I'm not going to change this person's mind or teach them anything, so just block and delete. Mm. So that's kind of like a, a weird thing as well. Have you found like obviously the intergenerational trauma is such a massive part of this whole thing. The healing that you experience, does do you find that it, uh, do you see a change in your dad or, do you, or your family through oh, your yeah. healing? I don't know if it's directly a result of me or if, It's also because there's this changing attitude externally as well. But the way my dad's opened up about a lot of the stuff that happened in his childhood in the last two years has been amazing. And his brother's done the same thing. Um, And I think they're all coming to terms with how abusive their father was um, and how much domestic violence my nan went through. And I'd never heard them talk about it before. And my dad's a white ribbon ambassador and he actually like – did a, a video series about it and, you know, got a bit of backlash from some of his cousins who obviously didn't live with his dad and stuff and, like, you know, my pop's now passed away and so they were, like, you're disrespecting him or whatever. Um, but he just, like, was so brave and, like, mm. so was, like, again, it's it's that healing process and he's, like, people can learn from what I went through. Mm. So, yeah, I think maybe it's because we are constantly talking about stuff, constantly sharing stories in our house and – um talking about culture and and what it means and like what our, for myself and my sister, like what our goals are moving forward, that maybe that's had some impact on on dad sharing. Um, But also because there is this kind of growing voice uh, all over Australia of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are killing it in whatever game that Mm. it is that they play. And, you know, using their platforms to talk about this stuff and normalise it. And change people's perspectives. Yeah. You, you talked about your sister and yourself, similar upbringing, different experience, mm. different way of coping with it. Like from listening to your podcast, you know, some of them made me feel really uncomfortable and then s- some of them didn't and they're different stories and they're people that have experienced a similar thing, dealing with them in different ways mm. and having a different outlook. What have you learnt about hearing that sort of, that, that difference across people 
yeah. having the same experience but yeah. just different perspective? Um, uh, it's really interesting. I think that I'm learning so much more about my culture and like the how varied and diverse the Aboriginal experience is. Um, I've never doubted that there's no one way to be an Aboriginal person or there's no one experience that makes you, you know, more Aboriginal than anyone else. Uh, you know, we really are a continent. Um, you know, before invasion there was a, over 500 different nations and so many different um, language groups and things like that. And I think that I've just had it reaffirmed in me that as individuals we represent that diversity in our experience. Um, I think that it means that some of the issues we face are far more complex um, because how they need to be addressed in different communities is like some of them is so different. Um, mm. And it's also like really beautiful, I think, if you think about um, the thousands of people who do identify as Aboriginal and all of their stories playing part a part in, in the continuation of the 80,000 years that we've already had, we're just this kind of amazing tapestry of, of um, kind of immense beauty and strength and also immense sadness and, you know, resilience and heartbreak um, that is – has the power to, I think, solve a lot of the issues that we see in this country f across the board, regardless of whether they're Indigenous specific or not. Um, and I, I guess a big part of what I want to see is like the rest of Australia looking at that and learning from it. And mm. also when they address individual Aboriginal people, not going in with any expectation because like you can think you know something because mm. you've met five Aboriginal people, but the sixth one is going to be a completely different story. I mean, what I, what I like about the podcast is that there is the difference in these stories and I guess maybe anger level or a way of communicating is that everyone receives information and digests it actually embodies it differently. So yeah. is there, a, have you found, you know, like is, is the anger, do you think that translates to education for someone on the other end? Because I think my thought from listening was I think it might for some. Yeah. Might, maybe not for other people, but nor that other style might not connect. Yeah. It is interesting that you raise this because it's um, an interesting thing that I was talking about with a friend of mine recently who's also Aboriginal. The way that we respond, you know, anger is like the natural instinct, I think, because when injustice happens, that's how you feel. You feel angry and frustrated and mm. you kind of want to fight fire with fire a little bit. But if we want to be really realistic about bringing people with us, I think there's a real fine line there. I think you need to be able to cement with people like how serious this is and how they really need to pay attention but also not ostracise them and kind of talk to them as if they are the, like, I don't know, the the devil in this mm. kind of situation. Um, and I think it's because I was that person. For a very long time I was that person and no one was walking, no non-Indigenous person wanted to listen to me because I was like, you are this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's still plenty of times, like in my speech today, I, I finished it um, by talking about, you know, when people hear these stories, they always say, like, how can we help you? How, you know, what can we do to help you help Aboriginal people? And I had to be quite honest and say, just because you're white doesn't mean you're more qualified to. Um, so I think something like that and not being like, don't come at us like this mm -hmm. and whatever, whatever. It's an honest statement. It's an open one, and it's one that um, I think causes you know some dialogue that are, are in this particular room. No one got defensive on it. They just went, "Okay, cool. Like I'll listen to you," sort of thing. Well, you shouldn't have to have all the answers yeah. in mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm. I even notice, like, any time I have someone from overseas come and visit, they'll ask just very basic questions about, like, even just Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, why is that street there? Or, and I realise how little I know about everything. And then I can only imagine as an Aboriginal woman how much you experience every day of people yeah. just asking every question. And I do put myself in a position where I guess people um, yeah, feel like they can come to me to ask questions. Um, I actually had an experience recently which caused a bit of division on the platform um, where someone I went to school with who – yeah, like I've obviously spoken about what my school experience was like and the handful of people who like backed me and supported me 
and even just comforted me when some things did happen was quite small. Um, and the rest kind of went, mm, like, we don't get it. Like, you're not really that Aboriginal because of how I looked. Um, and also like the get over it sort of attitude. Mm. And this person who reached out to me on my personal Instagram was one of those people who was indifferent. And also like, I very distinctly remember, I shouldn't say her, but now I've said her, oh well, um, her saying that she was scared of black men and she didn't know why, like in front of me, like for no apparent reason. Mm. And she'd message me and ask me a favor. Um, about connecting her to an Aboriginal artist and I just blatantly said no. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she kind of was like, oh, why? And I was like, look, I just think it's ridiculous that the two times that you've reached out to me since high school have been because she'd asked me to help her with a uni assignment like two years ago. And again, I said no. Um, and now she's asking me for this. I uh, have been to do things that would benefit you in your workplace and um, your study, but – it's got, you have no appreciation for the culture and no vulnerability of going like, Hey, I, you know, I'm growing, I'm learning. Mm. And, um, you just are coming to me as if I'm Aboriginal Google. Right. <laughs> and, um, I posted about it on Titters for Titters cause I think it was something that, um, a lot of people don't realize mm. is kind of quite taxing. Uh, so I, on the Titters for Titters platform, I answer every single question and I want people to ask questions and everyone always comes to me from a place of like, I really just don't know. It's mm. not demanding. It's just open and honest. And um, there's times where I have to go, I actually don't know. And and that's fine. And it's a really, really amazing um, kind of exchange of learning. Um. So when I posted about it, I was like, hey, like we need to talk about this because it takes a lot of energy a lot of the time to be that cultural spokesperson because like we've talked about, we don't know everything. And um, I'm also in it stupidly busy all the time and I don't have the time to do certain things, especially when it's something that you can literally just put into Google. Yeah. Um, so the response was really interesting because like – a vast majority of people were like, oh my God, this happens to me all the time. Like, I'm so glad you're talking about it because, you know, you want to find a nice way of being able to go like, yes, I want you to ask questions and that's great, but also pick the time and the, like respect me when you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was other people who were like, no, you shouldn't post about this because it's going to turn people away um, from wanting to ask these things. And then they'll just think that um, someone made a comment about like kind of the angry, angry black woman trope, which made me a little bit mad. Um, which is ironic. Um, and so that, that division was really kind of interesting and complex. And like, then people, like people who commented sort of like opposition to me, the people who were in agreement with me will like comment back and stuff. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa like, let's not, when this is not a place to argue, like this mm -hmm. is a really important discussion. And I think it can be really constructive. And, um, for the first like hour after I posted it because it like blew up really quickly, I was like, oh God, should I have done that? Um, but by the end of the day, I was like, no, this was really good. This was um, important and like it's about setting boundaries. Yeah. And I think, it, again, because of the journey that I've been on, I can, I'm not afraid to um, kind of be like, yeah, thank you for being part of this journey. But at the end of the day, don't make it about you. Mm -hmm. um, and But yeah, again, this like dialogue – back and forth between me and non-Indigenous people um, or our community and non-Indigenous people where uh, finding a balance and just working with everyone's egos and kind of trying to find a nice compromise, which I think sounds easy when you say it like that, but it is hard when there's all these different people. So that was, that was one of the times where I kind of, I don't know, I was a little bit torn about, you know, yeah. what to do and whatever. Well, it's beyond race too because it's, it's an entitlement. Like it, remind, yeah. it reminds me of people on sc school who I rarely talk to ask, like DM it. The reason, one of the reasons I got rid of Facebook was because mm -hmm. the amount of people asking which MacBook Pro they should buy because I had a tech blog once, right? Like yeah. people are. Are you sure like, I've sent him that? Same yeah, thing. Exactly, exactly. I'll help you now because you're busy. But yeah, it, it, is, it is interesting the, the idea of uh, picking, picking fights. And also there's a great book by uh, John Ronson called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, mm -hmm. which is all about when sort of the, uh, when it switches over from being that productive to that mob mentality of the exact yeah. s same thing. Yeah. How do you um, talk to young people who are where you were when you were young and angry? Yeah. 
Is it about saying, looking at it from another perspective or do they need to experience that? I think when it's been like an individual, like one-on-one situation, which I've luckily been able to be in with some young people who are very angry, um, I kind of open it up to them be like, yeah, tell me why you're angry and like have this angry moment mm. with me now so then we can um, – move past it and do that healing and then figure out how to express it, you know, better so you aren't getting kicked out of class in school and you aren't um, facing those, um, the negative things that come out of it. And when um, these individuals have an opportunity to express themselves like that and then like talk it through, that's, I find that they can, they build a lot of resilience that way. So, I mean, for, for people who are, who are going through that too, I don't know, maybe there is a, a certain level of you need to experience that or mm-hmm. if, if you have it, like feel it and own it and um, but don't hold on to it forever and don't let it turn you bitter yeah. because then that hatred that you get spewed at you wins because if it turns you into someone who's bitter, then you hold yourself back and then you can't grow and um, be better and do better for yourself. It's also interesting, like I guess what we're talking about is these massive cultural shifts of people and – like I even think about Australia Day and I think about like the, f- the, the flag and the, emotion, the emotive response I have of it now or the cringe mm. versus when I was a kid at the party with the cups yeah. and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, do you think that in a culture of everyone wants everything now, everyone wants to be woke now, everyone wants to be the one that's saying, you know, I've got all the answers, yeah, yeah. does it actually – like, do we need to take small incremental steps or are there actual radical shifts that will get us there? It's a balance of both. Mm. I think that in doing something like changing the date of Australia Day, that, you know, is a is a one step. It might seem like something radical, but really it's one step. Mm. And then what comes after it is the incremental changes around redefining the Australian identity. That's ultimately what the argument is about because – that's something that isn't very clear to a lot of people. And that's why people get caught up in the like, um, even my mum and my mum says that growing up that Australia Day wasn't a piss up. Like mm. people didn't get drunk the way that they do now and like make it this big party. Mm. She was like, it was never like that. Um, so I think we, you know, a lot of people have like misconstrued what it's meant to be about, which plays into like the toxicity of the day mm. and um, makes for really mm. awful um, kind of outcomes and I think that if that was changed if for, in order for it to be a success and um, we would have to make sure that the date it was changed to didn't become exactly the same as what it is now yeah. and it would it has to be about redefining like what does it mean to be Australian what are our values like you know we are such a diverse community how do we come up with something that's universal that we can all buy into how much shift is there in schools especially the primary school age of what education is and what's being taught around what's happened? Uh, well, I think it's a little bit different everywhere. Um, I don't know exactly like what the curriculum looks like. I only know of like um, the University of New South Wales a few years ago got um, quite a bit of uh, publicity when they started teaching their teaching students um, to say invasion rather than colonisation mm. and um, to be yeah, a little bit more honest about the beginning of um, what we know as Australia today. So that's interesting. I think that it's almost, yeah, the changes in universities mm. um, are, are where a lot of that can be cemented. Um, I went to UTS and they have uh, an incredible Aboriginal unit and they're actually building the first Indigenous residential college, um, which will be amazing. Uh, and they've embedded Aboriginal knowledges and practices into every single one of their subjects. Um, so it's what guides everything, regardless of what you're studying, regardless of what the topic is. Um, it's, yeah, so so that's really interesting as well. And I imagine that that's probably going to produce some teachers who have different perspectives too. Mm. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, um, from working with some kids in high school and stuff, it's still like Aboriginal history is one or two periods in year eight. Um, yeah, unless you do Aboriginal studies. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the young people of today will be the teachers of the future. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's that in, in terms of it changing and it, and not it might not change from a curricular level, but it fr- from a human level, yeah. the people going yeah. into those jobs, yeah. that's changed oh, and exactly. that's what we need. And so that's what 
inspires change too. Yeah. You're uh, one of those people, winter, you were in Europe. Uh, she lives in Sydney, mate. This, it's <laughs> not much winter up there. You're lucky. Very, uh, very no, lucky. It's cold in Melbourne, so you're having a great time in Europe. Uh, when you're travelling around and seeing other uh, countries and how they experience history and culture, what do you, what do you take away from all of that? Um, I've been really lucky. I've travelled so much throughout my life because my mum works for Qantas. Yes, that's staff travel okay. life. Oh, so there's, a, there's another novelty. Like, yeah. How many? Like, how, is she is she still working yeah. there? She's worked there for thirty years. Really? So. Dad like, a cop? Yep. That's yeah. a good double whammy. Yeah, it was isn't his 20, it? Yeah. Twenty-five year anniversary two days ago. Wow! Oh, congrats. congrats. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, and so, when hands. you were a kid, like the on the Qantas thing, not to make it all about that, but so. Was she, yeah, what what does she do at Qantas? Uh, she's moved around heaps. Yeah. Um, oh, God, I couldn't even list all the things she does. But now she is working in the freight bit. Mm. So she's in the office and making sure. Oh, no, I won't raise that. But she's got some really scary stories about um, sending dogs on planes. So if oh, I yeah. can tell anyone anything, never send your dog on a plane. Really? It's terrifying. Well, Virgin's doing their whole, like, you get frequent flyer points now mm, when you doggies. send your dog. Like, I'm thinking about getting a dog just so I can get Please status. Don't. Please, Please don't. Please don't. Airjet, there's like a dog, uh, businesses to send pets. Mm. United killed a dog uh, um, the other the other. No, month. like, can we... Yeah. That if that's the number one takeaway from this, <laughs> please just don't do it. Yeah. I, I will tell you some stories offline because you yeah. people don't need to hear it. Yeah. But yeah. no, it's like yeah. really yeah. awful. Dog stays home, well, right? No, dog I, stays I, home. I did drive your dog if dri- you have yeah. to go. Anywhere. Well, there's yeah. a story. You know the um, Hamish and Andy's true story uh, show. They did one where uh, a guy um, was working at the freight type of thing, like for the the animals. They um, the dog got to the location. And l- the guy looked, it was dead. Oh, no. So he found an old dog, like a dog that looked exactly the and same. Swapped it. Swapped it. The thing was, dog swap. The, the dog was actually dead already. So the, the owner rocked up and to the collect dog. the dead dog. <laughs> and it was alive. <laughs> and it was it's alive. Got back to life. Yeah. Oh, so that's crazy no. story. But no. anyway, back to, back, to the, back to the Europe thing. Because yeah. I find it interesting, like um, going to New Zealand specifically, oh, it yeah. seems like the relationship with the Indigenous people, like they've got it tap, like dialed in a bit Oh, a my bit God, more. a bit more. Yeah. There's so much. I mean, sometimes I feel like they're just a better country. Look at their yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So we've travelled heaps. I've mm. seen, you know, I've been really lucky to experience a lot of different cultures all over the world um, and also connect with other First Nations people. Um, I did a summer program at Stanford University um, in 2016 and met um, some Native American people for the first time and their stories are so similar to ours, um, which is quite, you know, it, it's nice because I see I see ways that we can work together but also heartbreaking because the kind of context in America is like there's so many oppressed minority groups that you're kind of all fighting for attention. Yeah. Um, but being able to do that and um, being able to experience cultures that way uh, in, in Europe – I found myself, you know, we were in Rome and um, at the Colosseum and things and and mum made a comment like, oh, look how old it is and stuff. And I said, mate, (laughs) you're joking, right? (laughs) You're joking. Like, oh, that's cute. Like a thousand years old, cute. Okay, I give me, you know, 60,000. Let's go to Brie Warner, the fish traps, 40,000 years old. Oldest lit surviving man-made thing in the world, Mm. right? So that's how I kind of look at those Mm. sorts of things. But I do find it interesting. yeah, particularly in Europe, I think there's, you know, people stand there in front of these things in awe and they're like amazing and everything. And they are, but I think they're perceived as amazing by so many people because it's still a Western idea of what success is. It's mm-hmm. these big buildings. It's a society that looks like the beginnings of the one that we know today. So I, I find that it's made me, um, I mean, being able to travel my whole life has been amazing and I'm so thankful for it because I think it's also played into who I am and how I understand other people and um, kind of also situating yourself in the world and kind of sometimes how – sometimes it's made you go, oh, I'm an insignificant, I'm an mm. ant on a speck on a speck, right? Mm. But also um, knowing that, you know, some of the big problems we see, are, are you know, they feel a little bit smaller sometimes and that's really – Nice. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I love travel so much and probably one of the best trips I had was last year I went to South America 
and did the Inca Trail. And um, mm. that was amazing. You know, our guide was um, an Indigenous man and he kind of told us all the stories and things like that. And again, when you have your own culture and um, your own stories that you appreciate and things like that, the way that you empathise and connect with people overseas is different, I think. And, um, yeah, it's it's beautiful. Um, and, yeah, I, I think it's definitely shaped who I am too. Mm. It, it can change your perspective, take you out your bubble. Yeah. Do you think – tourism is good for awareness or education or, or is there a missing piece? Cause I, you know, I've stood in the, um, the, the cathedral in Rome and like, you know, I'm just at awe of visually and, and yeah. hearing some things, but you know, take, uh, the huge rock in the middle of Australia and what's happening there mm. and tourism, you know, th- it, it thrives and that's how it helps people. Do you think it helps the awareness in the right way. Mm, I think that tur- tourism industries across the world have the same problem. So Rome is a prime example. Mm. The Vatican, amazing kind of structures and everything, but on the outskirts of it um, there's plenty of homeless people. Mm. And you kind of go, what, you're a church, like isn't mm. that your job to look after all of God's people, you know, if that's your thing. No, no, 70 euro to get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's but fair. that's exactly the point, right? There's all these contradictions. Mm. So, again, you want to go to um, – the central part of Australia see this, you know, phenomenon that is Uluru and you recognise it as a, you know, spiritually significant place for Aboriginal people. But then the contradiction is you go and pay to climb it when it mm. is completely um, inappropriate and so offensive to all Aboriginal Australians. So I think it exists everywhere. And I think that um, responsible tourism is probably something that needs to be focused on. And um, I mean, the, when they're looking at the bottom line, when they're looking at the dollars that mm, they can make, yeah, that's hard. Mm. There is a um, growing Indigenous tourism industry which owned and run by Aboriginal people, which I think is amazing. Mm. And I think um, another thing about uh, kind of I, I often say that an international person uh, and a lot of just regular Australians' perspective of what, what Aboriginal people – are and where they live in, in that is kind of the Tourism Australia pitch. In the Red Desert, they all look a lot darker than me um, mm. and kind of live quite traditionally, mm-hmm. right, which just isn't the case. The highest population of Aboriginal people in the country is in Western Sydney, right? That's the highest concentration. Lots of people don't know that. Um, so w- people's perception of where Aboriginal Australia is, that it's really remote, it's really far um, away from the average person is something that needs to be dispelled. Um, and I think a part of that is, so we are seeing, you know, our voices rise in Australia, but there needs to come a point when we kind of get to that international level as well, mm. which seems far away in some Feels cases. Feels like we have s- such a long way to go <laughs> yeah. in but regards then, like locally. Yeah. But then you think of someone like Paddy Mills, mm. um, the basketballer, and he has just like, just got married, has been here with, with the boomers. Mm. Um, and instead of having a honeymoon, he went out to a town called Udna Dada in um, South Australia and like did this and worked with like all the kids and stuff and like gave them heaps of stuff and travelled around a few different remote communities and all documented on his social media. So he's bringing stories of remote Australia to an international stage because he plays in the US. Um, so I, as much as it does feel like we ha- we do have a lot there's no doubt, actually, that we have a lot of work to do in this country. Um, what happens is when we do have um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people given the same opportunities as other Australians in education, in employment, in everything, what we see is not them meeting um, the average kind of standard. They exceed it. Mm. That's what happens. Um, it's been shown in a lot of, um, like, I yeah, I used to work for an education program and what we'd find is when um, kids were mentored through their schooling and told that they could do more than what was expected of them from their schools a lot of the time, they didn't just get average marks, they got the best marks in their class. So there's so much opportunity there, I think, that if we continue to build up, um, you know, better understanding and, yeah, more opportunity for everyone, you'll just see us kind of like rise up and take over. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, you get ask a lot of questions, a lot of them probably coming from people who have no idea. What is, what's the one question that you get the most? What are people 
constantly asking you? Um, oh, I mean, a lot of people are asking you how to help. Mm-hmm. Um, with Titus for Titus, a lot of people ask how to help and the answer to that now is um, spreading the word and um, being a part of it and learning. I think the biggest thing that non-Indigenous Australia can do is sit back and listen and listen to learn, not listen to respond. Because um, I think a lot of the time people want to sit and listen to stories so they can talk about their perspective or their opinion on things when it should just be I'll listen to this, I'll mm. learn, I'll take it on and I'll grow as a person. So, I mean the great thing about things like podcasting is it is spreading the word or it's like it's in a startup word, it's that scalable thing, right? Yeah. It's scaling mm. you so yeah. that people get, it's like, oh, well, you can just listen to that. Are there any resources or technology that's that's come about in the past few years around this space um around like in i mean sort of indigenous education yeah, it, yeah. like because i guess just googling it like there's a um there's a great site i think it's called just google it.com and you can put in uh the question that they ask and it will spit out an animation of a cursor going and typing it in and pressing Google. So yeah. then it's sort of a passive aggressive way of <laughs> yeah, telling yeah, people yeah. to Google it, which is great. But <laughs> no, also but there are definitely... Google's a bit fucked. Like Google, yeah, yeah. there's a bit of like there's bad information. Like when I was uh, in, uh, when I was like 15 years old, uh, we went to Central Australia for a school camp and the what we were told around things is just so different to the actual um, reality. So it, that was a, a time where it was like, oh, you know, uh, uh, Aboriginal people are, um, uh, you know, like they're looking after all the tourism stuff. So climbing Uluru, it's like, uh, you know, they've got it all, like it's their business and blah, blah, blah. And there's a few, and at that point in like 2006 from me being in a coach in a bus, you know, being educated on this sort of stuff, uh, it's so easy to see how misinformation yeah, around this stuff yeah. can happen. So like a great place to start is with resources that are authored by Aboriginal people. Um, there's plenty of uh, – a great book that I couldn't recommend more is Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe. Mm. Um, it's just incredible in the way that it um, dispels so many myths about how our society operated prior to um, the British arriving. Uh, and it also uh, – helps people unlearn that we are were this kind of unsophisticated, um, unintelligent society. We actually had some of the most sophisticated systems, um, means of agriculture and um, everything. It's, it's really incredible. So books like that, um, I will plug a book that I'm in uh, yeah, called Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia, um, which has been edited by Anita Heiss and it's a collection of uh, short stories um, of which I wrote one. And, um, yeah, a, a whole plethora of, of different Aboriginal people, the youngest writer was uh, 15, the oldest was in their 70s and one person wrote from jail. Like it does a pretty good job at painting how diverse um, our experiences are. So so starting with that sort of stuff and um, just, yeah, being hungry for it and mm. um, going to local events. If you see something, particularly around um, January 26, NAIDOC week, Reconciliation week, when you see those events, go and be a part of them, listen, start conversations with people because that's kind of the time of year when we're ready to kind of talk about a lot of stuff um, and also interact with Aboriginal businesses. Yeah. Um, that's that's a really great thing to do as well. I think social media also, there's such an opportunity of like who you follow and who you're consuming. Mm, yeah. And I think that's like, I think a great starting point is just going on to you know, Titus for Titus and following and just like yeah. engaging and understanding. And then there's so many people right? that we share that mm. you'll, you know, want to follow them. Yeah. A lot of artists, a lot of people who are doing like crazy stuff that you just wouldn't even think mm. exists. Um, so, yeah, like I guess we are kind of a starting point for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of discussions and lots of events that happen that people don't know about. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. You've got a great podcast. Thank yeah, you. it's it's amazing. Likewise, and I, I think like the what you're talking about these other resources, mm-hmm. it is a resource. Yeah, I'm listening to it, thinking, "Fuck, I don't know this shit." Yeah, yeah, and I, I feel really uncomfortable, and that's the good thing, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like yeah. it's okay to feel uncomfortable about this stuff because yeah. does it make you a bad person? Yeah, it yeah makes yeah. you someone who wants to be better. Well, I think people try and get away from discomfort, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's probably not it's it's not where the change lives. Yeah. 
and it's about the the con- what we consume as well, mm. right? Mm. Like it's so. I think about like uh, Tommy and I will go to an event, and then for the next two weeks we're talking about it and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's slight shifts in what can we do. Well, like you can go listen to a podcast, and, and- also be like conscious of the mainstream media that you mm. consume as well, because yeah. there's a, a lot of mainstream media that doesn't do a good job of representing anyone yeah you know and so just be conscious of that stuff as well Mm -hmm. awesome well congratulations with everything you've built it's like awesome seeing the start of this journey it feels like it's just the beginning so we should would love to have you back on sometime soon Thank you. Uh, Maybe I'll be too famous. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have bodyguards. So be fine. Uh, hi, the daily talk show.com is the email address. If you want to send us an email, if you've enjoyed the show, uh, take a screen grab, take a photo. If you're somewhere uh, exotic or tropical or somewhere other yeah, than yeah. cold Melbourne <laughs> and uh, otherwise we'll uh, see you tomorrow. See you guys. Gotcha.